Most people focus on the two-dimensional surface that we have here on Earth, disputes about uh, financial matters, you know, Brexit. When you look at the big picture, these, these are childish issues. ago, before I was born, the Apollo 11 space flight landed the first two people on the moon. Do you believe it? You should. It actually did happen. President Trump wants to go further. We will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many worlds beyond. Hello and welcome to a special outer space edition of your G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And to help me get a better grasp of what's out there many worlds beyond, I have two very special guests. The first, former commander of the International Space Station. The second, a Harvard physicist whose work on black holes is eclipsed only by his theories on alien life. Get the eclipse, that's a space pun. Taken together, Chris Hadfield and Avi Loeb offer a unique look at the cosmos. My God, it's full of stars. Of course, I've also got your puppet regime. Zucker Data, where are we? My data says that we're in the desert of an oil-rich community that you despise. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep our lights on. It was 10 a.m. January 3rd. This year, China's space program was moments away from doing something no one had ever done. A lunar probe, named after a Chinese goddess, descended on the far side of the moon. When it finally touched down at 10.26 a.m., the unmanned craft would deliver the clearest signal yet of China's growing ambitions in space. Though Chinese tech still has a lot of catching up to do, its lunar landing threw American and Russian space dominance into question. Mars, Jupiter, asteroids, they're all now in Beijing's sights. A new space race has begun, but this time the field is more crowded. In fact, India is planning its first human space flight next year on the cheap. Japan has already harvested space rocks from an asteroid, which is a space rock. So that sounds sneaky and the U.S., which for years favored a more privatized approach, like send Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos into space, has plans to up its game at the federal level. Mr. Trump, you do the honors. Space Force. Space Force. Space Force. Space Force, that's where it's at. Space Force. Space Force, that's where it's going to be. The Space Force. Space. Space Force. Building the Space Force. The Space Force. Does that make sense? Thing is, the cosmos is an unforgiving place in space. Nobody hears you scream. Despite political posturing at home, nations have often been forced to work together. And few know this better than the former commander of the International Space Station. Why must man go into space? To explore his world, man has always risked the unknown. My name is Chris Hadfield. Uh, when I was a kid, the very first people flew in space. And it changed my whole perspective of what I might be able to do. Me, this little Canadian kid, maybe I could do that. And looking back now, after three space flights and visiting two different space stations and doing spacewalks and commanding the International Space Station, it was even better than I dreamed it would be. Flying a rocket ship 
is both exhilarating and crazy dangerous. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. My very first flight was on a space shuttle. Uh, in fact, it was on Atlantis in the fall of 95. The power is, is staggering. It's, it's like 80 million horsepower and you can feel all of them, all of those horses kicking you. This thing starts to, to violently ram you up through the atmosphere. You're crushed in your seat. You're shaken uh, where you can't even focus on the instruments in front of you. But finally, at the end of it, the vehicle has gotten you to just the right altitude. The computers have done their job. They've, they've honed you in on perfectly the right direction. You're just about out of fuel and the engine shut off and you're weightless. It, it's an amazing transition. It's the most wildly different nine minutes of my whole life. And the best part is that's just the start of space flight. I've spent about half a year off the Earth, most of it onboard space stations. We would talk to mission controls all around the world. Station, this is Houston. And each of them would tell us what's going on today, the important stuff, the priority stuff, see if you had any questions. And then we'd split. All six astronauts working all the experiments, working all of the, the maintenance that had to go on. Maybe you're talking to the president today. You gotta get ready for that and get the camera set. Maybe you're helping to make an IMAX movie, or you're running a nanoparticle experiment, or seeing how flame behaves without gravity, or, or looking at the radiation environment, or testing a new piece of equipment that removes carbon dioxide from the air. Or the, we run about 200 experiments, always on the space station. So here's a soaking wet washcloth. Space Station is a wonderful, very hard-earned and proven example of how we can explore the next stepping stones in space together as a species. I mean, it's weird for 15 countries cooperatively to be doing anything for decades at a time and, and doing it peacefully and cooperatively. And yet Russia and England and Germany and Japan and the United States and Canada and all the other partners, we've been doing that on the Space Station since the early 90s, every single day hand and glove. And so as we go from the space station, where we've tested equipment, done experiments, learned how to work together, now it's time where we can sort of sail over the horizon with our next spaceships. It's an amazing start of a whole new era of human capability and evolution. And the rocket ships that we're building and flying right now, the ones I've had a chance to fly, they are just the initial enablers of all of that. Back on Earth, astronomers across four continents have also been busy working together. In April, more than 200 researchers revealed one of the most mysterious entities in the cosmos. Working together with eight telescopes around the world, they peered out into space to capture the first ever image of a black hole, some 55 million light years away. My next guest worked on that very project. If life is out there, we should search for it. In principle, we can shorten the time it takes to reach targets of interest in the solar system. Avi Loeb, uh, professor, director of the astronomy department here at Harvard, founder of the Black Hole Institute, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. We've been sort of submerged uh, into this first photograph um, that everyone has now seen, um, which you said was not all that surprising. It wasn't surprising because a decade ago, we wrote a paper with my postdoctoral fellow, Avery Broderick, in which we predicted how the image would look like. That was the first paper that drew attention to M87, this giant galaxy that is much bigger than the Milky Way galaxy, at the distance that is 2,000 times farther than the distance to the center of our galaxy. But because it has a black hole that is six and a half billion 
times the mass of the Sun, that is about 1,600 times more massive than the black hole in the Milky Way galaxy. It's so big on the sky that we can actually resolve its shadow. So we wrote this paper where we made predictions. About more easily than we can the black hole in our own galaxy. Yeah, both of them occupy roughly the same angle on the sky, mm -hmm. which is tiny, by the way. We're basically using, uh, we correlate uh, the data that is obtained from stations across the globe. And from that, we basically use the entire Earth as an aperture and can resolve the tiny size of uh, the shadow of the black hole. So about 15 years ago, we wrote a series of theoretical papers with my postdoc predicting how the image would look like. And by the way, it was quite rewarding to see it on the cover of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Everything. All over the world. Right? All over the world. Something that was just theoretical a decade ago, uh, appearing for real. And um, there are two ways by which you can analyze such an image and learn something new. First, it could have been that Einstein was wrong, that gravity is not really behaving the way his equations prescribe a black hole to look like. And it, it seems that the equations work fine, that the predicted shape of the black hole shadow resembles what we see. The second thing that you can learn is how matter behaves under extreme conditions in the vicinity of a black hole, where you know, once you cross the so-called horizon, which is a region around the black hole, uh, once you enter into it, you can never check out, which is an amazing concept if you think about it, because a black hole is just a distortion of space and time. There is nothing there. You can cross the horizon of this M87 black hole and you wouldn't even notice. Nothing will happen to your body. It's just that your friend who might be outside uh, the horizon would not be able to receive any signals from you. It's the ultimate prison. Even light cannot escape from that region. You can cross the horizon without feeling anything, but then eventually you reach the so-called singularity in the middle where you will be torn apart by the very extreme gravitational tidal force. But the gravitational body. pull at the horizon is something that in principle would not destroy all that. No, uh, if the black hole is big enough. Mm -hmm. These objects that are extremely massive, these beasts, black holes that exist very early in the universe, by the way, we find them when the universe was only 5% of its present age. Sort of like looking at a nursery and finding a giant baby already early on. Um, we find such black holes up to billions of solar masses early in the universe, and they are very rarefied. So you can cross the horizon of those without noticing anything unusual. On the other hand, a star that is approaching the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy would get spaghetti size. It will get stretched into a stream of gas that uh, uh, destroys it, basically. And we see such events every 100,000 years. And so when we see all of that light that is around the black hole in the photos, is that uh, the debris of stars that are being distorted by the black hole itself? It could be most likely just gas that fell towards that drain, that sink from the host galaxy. So the way to think of it is just like water going down the bathtub and there is a reservoir of gas in the host galaxy that uh, slowly drifts inwards and uh, accretes onto the black hole, and that's how the black hole grows in mass. Now, I have to say, when I first saw the reporting on you in your response to this object, Oumuamua, I was a little surprised that everyone was surprised that you were saying this because, I mean, you know, it seemed like an unexplained object deserves to have speculation, right? That's what science is all about. But you've taken a fair amount of heat from many in the field who seem to argue that this is not acceptable approach to science. Now, I mean, I figure because you're here at Harvard, you have tenure, you know, you run the center, uh, some, some clearly disagree, but what's it like for you in the field right now as an academic? How do you think about the way your discipline functions on these great unknowns? Well, uh, first of all, I should say that the people I respect scientifically were very supportive. Uh, there was a small minority of people that I do not particularly respect uh, that were vocal about it. 
It's very unfortunate because if you look at the history of science, uh, it is, the progress was always based on independent thought and on evidence, not so much on social pressure. And what I see is people objecting to the notion of an extraterrestrial civilization as part of the mainstream of uh, astronomy, while at the same time, in theoretical physics, people contemplate the notion of extra dimensions for which we have no evidence. String theory. String theory. It simply helps some theories unify two pillars of modern physics, quantum mechanics and gravity, through the mathematics of extra dimensions. But that doesn't mean that extra dimensions exist. If you just look at the evidence, we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And if you were conservative, you would basically say, let's unify those theories within what we know. Nevertheless, people are allowing themselves to explore the hypotheses that are extra dimensions, and it's becoming very popular. There is a whole community of people doing that. And that, to me, is a paradox, while at the same time, if I say that on many other planets, a quarter of all the stars have a planet similar to the Earth, and if the conditions on it are similar to those on Earth, you might get the same outcome. People have a taboo on discussing it. I find that unhealthy, because I think that we should put all possibilities on the table and explore the evidence. Uh, the problem with having a prejudice and gut feeling is basically that it assumes that the future will be the same as the past, and it doesn't rely on evidence. And uh, I think we should not have a prejudice simply based on the history that, of science. Uh, for example, just to give an example, sure. in 1952, there was an astronomer that said, let's imagine the solar system being arranged a little differently. Let's imagine taking Jupiter and putting it closer to the sun. And if that's the case, then it would move the sun back and forth as it moves around the sun, and we might be able to detect the existence of such a planet much more easily. And so let's search for closing Jupiters around other stars. For 40 years, time allocation committees on major telescopes refused to give time to observers to look for such systems. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we know about Jupiter being far from the sun in the solar system, and we have a theoretical understanding of why this is the case. 40 years later, some astronomers mm -hmm. dared to look and found the first exoplanet, which was Jupiter close to a star. Mm -hmm. It opened a new field of the study of exoplanets. And since then, thousands of planets were discovered. If you think that you know the truth before having evidence for it, you are misleading yourself. So what's the research area in your field right now that excites you most? What's the one that you think is most fertile for a worldview, a philosophical changing conclusion? I think it's the search for extraterrestrial life. You do. Either in the form of microbial life uh, or in the form of technological signatures that we might find out there. It would have a fundamental uh, effect on society. It will change our perspective about our place in the universe. Uh, it could uh, introduce new areas of research, for example, how to communicate with another civilization, astrolinguistics, how to trade with other civilizations, how to learn from their technology. Um, can we, should we ask them for answers to questions uh, that bother us? We can learn much more than we can teach. Uh, Look, if in you're that willing process. to power your lights with dead dinosaurs, you should be willing to get borrow technology from extraterrestrials. I mean, neither of which have anything to do with us. Right? I agree. Most people focus on the two-dimensional surface that we have here, here on Earth, worry about mundane issues like borders, uh, disputes about uh, financial matters, you know, Brexit, uh, these are, when you look at the big picture, these, these are childish uh, issues. Uh, we really have to think bigger than that uh, because uh, in the long term, we will be forced to think bigger than that. I mean, Brexit is stupid even in the context of the short term, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just an enormous waste of time. But generally speaking, I see where you're going with this. And, and the way I see science is as a continuation of our childhood curiosity. I remember my childhood as being very enjoyable, growing up on a farm and basically thinking about the big questions and not being afraid of making mistakes and just being curious. And when I watch people around me um, as I entered academia, I noticed that this 
uh, innocence, this uh, fundamental curiosity is being lost. You have to play to the tunes of selection committees. You have to look distinguished. Uh, you have to look nice in the mirror. I know, but tenure means never having to look distinguished. Exactly. That's so, in fact, thing. that's the paradox. Yeah. You would expect tenure, which was formulated in order to give academic freedom to scholars, you would expect people to behave in a more uh, risky uh, way, taking uh, innovative ideas and pushing them uh, in order to find the truth. I mean, you never know in advance. Um, you have to take some risks as you do uh, in, in the context of business. And the strange thing is the business world adapted to that. Uh, there, there are venture capitalists funding a lot of risky projects uh, because they know that one of them might mature one day and pay for all the rest, all the failures. And for some reasons, academia became much more sterile. Um, and the issue I see is that it also leads the public um, to uh, some kind of a, a, to develop a distance from academia. Uh, uh, in the populist movements, academia is viewed as the elite. And I see that as a self-inflicted wound. I see that uh, because I, I notice my colleagues saying, let's find out the truth in, in a closed room, figure out the final answer, and then come out to the press or to the public when we know for sure what the answer is. To me, that sounds arrogant. Uh, the public should see that most of the scientific process involves uncertainty, where we don't have enough evidence, we're trying to find the truth. Once we converge with a unified opinion, it means that the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't want it to be magic. No, I want it to be transparent and straightforward. And in fact, when people come to help me at home, for example, when we had the problem uh, where the basement was flooded and uh, because the sewer was clogged by uh, roots from the nearby trees, it occurred to me that um, we don't often think about what happens to matter as it falls into a black hole. You know, just the same way that I didn't think about where the water goes when it leaves my house. It goes to a reservoir of the town. But I've never thought about that until the sewer was clogged. Sure. So that led me to think, where does matter actually collect in the inside of a black hole? Uh, and I thought maybe there is an object there, a quantum object, where all the matter that falls in, you know, six and a half billion solar masses that made the M87 black hole must collect somewhere. And as a result of the sewer at my home being clogged, I started thinking about it. Maybe there is a quantum object at the maximum density that we can imagine where all the matter assembles. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it goes somewhere else, you know, to another universe or it, it's really a fundamental question that we cannot answer at the moment because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. Or, or maybe your drain pipe is an event horizon. <laughs> and you just shouldn't put your hand beyond that. I mean, that's the other possibility. Avi Loeb, thank you very much. My pleasure. And now for something completely different, I've got your puppet regime. Last time on Space Force. We were busy exploring the galaxy for condo investment opportunities when we ran out of fuel and hurtled toward a strange planet. Zuckerdata, where are we? My data says that we're in the desert of an oil-rich community that you despise. Yes, Iran! We finally invaded Iran! John, what the hell are you doing here? Simmer down, it's not Iran. Iran doesn't have taco bowls growing in the desert no. like that. It's somewhere closer. Hmm? Captain, look, over <gasps> there! Hmm? It's America! We're home! Come on, guys, you can all come too. Except for you, Angela. We don't want any more German imports. Well, that is highly illogical. Is that what I think it is? Well, it only looks like a half-built structure to me, Mr. President. It's a wall. Oh, my wall. Oh, hello, wall. Open up, it's me. Please step back. You are too close to the United States. Thank you, and yes, I am very close to America as president, which I won by the largest margin in history. Prove it. Prove what? Prove that you are president. 
documents, please. Uh, 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 Zuckerberg, you have everyone's data, don't you? Could you? We lost it all in the crash, Captain. Plus, I'm trying to respect privacy now. God. We need the tax returns, college transcripts, high school report cards. Those are things that will not be released by me as your president. Then you will file for asylum like everyone else. Look, this is a disgrace. Coyotes, yes, people are saying they will help us get through. That is just the animal, Captain, the animal. You know, I have very, very powerful weapon that will enable us to infiltrate United States. Wait here, I bring it right now. We did not have this conversation. <gasps> very sophisticated. Whoa, no big deal. Public machine. That's our show this week. We'll be back next week, because it's a weekly show. That's, it's awesome the way that works. Please don't miss it. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, and, and you're still here, so obviously you did, check us out on g0media.com.